So here we are. That's perfect. Which one was it this time? That's great. All right. So um, what we are what we are talking about, you know, within um, Sophia, and just to, uh, Jaltrudis already said, we want to create two things. We want to identify specific biomarkers, we want to understand the disease, and we want to predict the effect of the treatment. So we want to predict a risk, and we want to predict a response. And, and that's really what Sophia is about. And that's what you want and I want in clinic as well. Because at the moment, if a patient walks in the door with type 2 diabetes and obesity, we do not have any idea if this patient is going to respond to a GLP-1 therapy or whether or not this patient would be better treated with an SGLT2. You know, we don't know that individual person's response, but if you treat somebody um, and their father responds really well to a GLP-1 analog, if you treat the daughter of that same patient, the daughter will have a response very similar to the father. So we know that it must be predictable, um, but we don't have those um, ability to predict just yet. So <clears throat> what we have done is been bringing together FPA. FPA are all the big pharmaceutical companies as well as the surgical device companies in Europe. So this means Lilly is a partner, Novo Nordisk is a partner, Buringer Ingheim is a partner, Medtronic is a partner. So if we look at the people who are sponsoring this great meeting today, they are the same people who are um, partners within Sophia. So that means we are really bringing together the best in academia together with the best in industry. Because the problems that are being solved is that what we call pre-competitive. And that's again why I want to invite anybody here because it's not about Imperial College competing with University College Dublin, competing with the Catholic University of Leuven. We are not competing with each other. We are working together <coughs> because by addressing these problems, we all win. And that is the reason why even the pharmaceutical companies, why Lilly is working with Novo, is working with Buringer Ingheim, because they understand that it is really to their advantage. And this process, this IMI process, has been very successful within Europe um, and therefore has delivered many, um, many benefits to the European communities. So let's think about how Kuwait could be part of this. So if we think about the overall aim, you know, this is something that Kuwait also wants which is delivering the evidence and shared value to optimize obesity treatments. If we think about where we are in the project now, as Jaltrudi has said, we are at the halfway mark. So we have de-risked the project. So all the big risks have already been taken and all the big risks has paid off. So when you enter now, it actually has much better, um, much better chances of success. And it's this combination of pharmaceutical companies, patient organization, medical device companies, and academic partners. So you may be here as an academic partner, or you may be even here as a patient organization, or as a, a company. So there is a space for people to work together. And as Jaltrudi um, again said, if we, if we look at um, how the work packages finish, um, we have now completed the work package two, three, four, and five. So the first part is what we did in the first two and a half years. And now the work starts to work at the work package that Jaltrudi is leading at work package six, the validation, the work package seven, which is the patient voice is working, and now we also have the shared value that's coming around. And that is where um, it's also very um, easy to join at this point because um, your data stays secure. So we as a collab, we as a consortium will come to you and say, we have these important research questions. Do you have the data to help us address this and answer it? 
So this is our governance structure, and governance is very important in this region, but it's also very important in the European Union. So it means that there's lots of checks and balances, and it means nobody can steal anybody else's data. There is a consortium agreement that manages how we interact with each other. It's sort of the rule book that we play, uh, that we play accordingly, but it's also a, a rule book written in such a way that we want every partner to exit Sophia with more than they entered. So it's the idea about adding value to what you have. So if you bring data into this, you exit with more than you entered into the system. We have more than 46 cohorts at the moment, more than 1.7 million people, people who are normal weight, overweight, have obesity, have prediabetes, type 1 diabetes, and type 2 diabetes. Uh, and a lot of those cohorts were used to make discoveries. And what we now need to do is we need to validate those discoveries. And that's why we are reaching out to people to say, if you are able to help us, we would be delighted to work with you. Because ultimately what we want to do is create shared value. And shared value is this idea about doing well by doing good. So we want you as a clinician to do well by doing the right thing for your patients. We want patients to do well by doing the right thing, by giving their time and giving their expertise. We want industry to do well financially, to have a better share price, because they are investigating people living with obesity and type 1 diabetes, people living with obesity and type 2 diabetes, um, because that is the right thing. So this is the concept where we bring together the business opportunities, the social needs of our societies, but also the government assets. Many of us work in hospitals, you know, government hospitals, um, or even private hospitals, to actually bring this together, because we want to have everybody do better. We want to have all boats rise on the tide. So if you are interested to join, please look at the website, um, so imisophia.eu, um, there's also our social media handles, um, because we also have a responsibility to communicate what we find as quickly as possible. Because, of course, the people who are giving us our money is the European Union, and the European Union want to share the information. They want this information to be translated so that you in your clinic can use it as quickly as possible. So it's really this idea that, you know, everybody in the world need to benefit because the European taxpayer has put a lot of money into this, the European industry has put a lot of money into this, and what we want is for people to benefit. So thank you very much, and um, I'll uh, be delighted to go over to the final um, step, unless there's any questions. Good. Yes, please. <clears throat> very good question. So, yeah, so, so very good question. So when we started Sophia, we did not know what we were going to discover. So we had a completely open mind. And what we were able to do is to put together the best and biggest cohorts in Europe. And that meant we have genomics, we have lipidomics, we have proteomics, we have metabolomics, um, and we also have um, uh, my, the microbiota. And what we were able to do in a hypothesis-free environment, we were able to look at the data and to try and discover um, where do we see opportunities? So when we started the project, I genuinely thought that we may end up with 10 things that you can measure in plasma, be it genomics or metabolomics or biochemistry, as predictors. Right? Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that we did not discover that. What we have discovered are different things. We are discovering, you know, different clusters of how we are thinking about, you know, obesity as a disease. But we are also discovering that certain cohorts of people, for example, people with obesity and people with prediabetes as a cohort, they behave differently than people, for example, that have obesity but don't have prediabetes. So now we are able to predict risk. 
Um, but what we've also been able to do is use um, these multiple biomarkers that we have and use artificial intelligence for machine learning to then drive um, processes to try and predict who's going to respond. So one of the papers that's just coming out, and there's a, a tool already available on the website, the Sophia tool, where we can predict how much weight somebody will lose if they have a bypass or if they have a sleeve gastrectomy. So for the first time, clinicians can go to the tool. It's very easy. It's free. You put six variables in, and you can have a conversation with your patient and say, if you have a bypass, this is likely what's going to happen to you. If you have a sleeve, this is likely what's going to happen to you. So that is a tool that you know, is already available. Now, it's a crude tool, I would say, but you know, we want to improve on that you know, with our, with our metabolic Proteomics, proteomics, lipidomics, and genomics. One of the other things that we now have within Sophia is, again, I'm just focusing on bariatric surgery because that's where we have some of the best data. We have more than 10,000 people with full genomic profiles. So that's the first time that we'll be able to look at genetic predictors you know, for surgery. But if we can show that to, to be true in surgery, then we may also be able to apply it to nutritional therapies, or we may also be able to apply it to um, pharmacotherapies. Because where we want to be in obesity is where cancer, where we want to be in obesity in 10 years from now, where cancer is today. So if you have a cancer today, it's very likely that you know, they're going to take a biopsy, they're going to run some diagnostics on that tissue sample, and they're going to say you will respond better to this treatment or you will re better respond to that treatment. And that's really what's improved cancer treatments, is that diagnostic ability, and that's where we want to go with Sophia and obesity. So this is a no, 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 correct. So Jaltrudi has listed um, the, the partners already. But so just to, rem to remind you, this was a European Union project. So therefore, the European Union is keen for this to be mostly European partners. So within Europe, we have more than 32 different partners from different countries. But we do have partners now also from outside of the European Union. Uh, predominantly, we have the UK as a partner. We have the US as a partner. And we now also have Kuwait as a partner. Um, now, the way it works is that we can't move money from the European Union to partners outside. Um, so there's no money that can move anymore, and we've used up all the money in fairness. But what we are able to do is to um, be able to offer open collaboration. You know, and very often what people are finding is by using some of the discoveries that's being made, they can get local funding, so they can apply for local grants to actually support them. So that is a way of, of the way we are doing it. So it started off very much with the European Union focus, because that's the remit, um, but we have been able to expand that. And so the partners outside of Europe are called beneficiaries, not receiving funding. So that's the, the, the official terminology within the EU system. Yeah? So, so, we, so the question is, you know, is there a minimum number of patients, et cetera, for example, to contribute? It really has to do with the benefit. Okay? So we're talking about you as a partner must benefit from being part of Sophia. But also, Sophia must benefit from you as a partner. So it's really this balance. Okay? So therefore, if you think that Sophia can do something that's really going to benefit you and your institution, then that is half of the battle won. Then you also need to work out how can your institution benefit Sophia. And you know, the thing that we are really looking for at the moment is um, data sets where we can come and validate our discoveries. 
Um, so, or, but uh, there's also other opportunities, you know, when it comes to communication of the data, or there's, there's opportunities on the patient voice, or there's opportunities on shared value. So, for example, if we can show that the discoveries that's being made within Sophia can go and change policy, right, then that is a massive benefit, right? Because if we can change the way that regulators think about obesity and type 1 diabetes or obesity and type 2 diabetes, or we can show how reimbursement agencies change their mind, then that is the ultimate goal of what we are doing. Good. I'm going to switch tack, and the final talk of the day is really the future of obesity treatment. Now, this is a famous Botticelli um, that depicts uh, Dante's Inferno. And you may remember um, that Dante's Inferno deals with the very European concept of the seven mortal sins. Right? Now, first of all, you need to remember that to be sinful is a willful act. Right? So, therefore, a sin is something that somebody decides to do. And this is a European concept um, that has really influenced our thinking because two of the mortal sins, one is gluttony and the second one is sloth. So, therefore, European thinking has really been driven by this idea that people that have obesity, people who eat too much, gluttony, or people that do, don't do enough exercise, that don't move enough, sloth, that that is their decision. Right? And this thinking has therefore driven this idea that the way we should treat obesity is we need to tell people that it's not a good idea to eat too much and it's not a good idea not to move enough. And actually, we need to tell them that they are not good people. It's a sin, you know. They need to try harder. Okay? And we have done this very, very successfully, telling people that they are bad people, that they are sinful, and that they should try harder for the last, you know, 300 years in Europe. And it has not helped anybody. Because in the, last, in the last decades, despite us telling people that they are bad people and they should try harder, we've actually only increased the amount of obesity over time. So this approach is not the future. This approach is the past. And now the science is changing, and I think you've heard some of the cutting edge science um, today, and now we are seeing how this is changing. So you've seen my conflicts of interest, and uh, this is now the next step. So the first thing I, need, I think we need to do in the future when we think about obesity is we have to differentiate obesity as a disease on this side and on this side what we call the cultural desire for thinness. And what we're already seeing in the media playing out now is that the media are not sophisticated enough to differentiate due to these two things. They think that anybody that has obesity must also have a cultural desire for thinness, and they think everybody that has a cultural desire for thinness is the same as having obesity. So I think the future is going to be that we are going to differentiate that. We will not be able to make people thin, and we will not be able to make people happy. So we will not be able to successfully treat people who have a cultural desire for thinness. But what you have heard today is we have incredibly good treatments for the disease of obesity. Now the way this is influencing my practice in, at the moment is when somebody comes into my clinic, I, the first thing I try to work out is why is the patient in my clinic? Is this patient here because they want to become thin and they want to become happy? And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be thin and happy. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that I can't help you. 
right? Or does this person come to me because they understand that they have a disease called obesity and this disease has complications and what they are prepared to do is treat this disease and take treatment for this disease, nutritional therapies, pharmacotherapies or surgical therapies for the rest of their life. And once that becomes clear, then, as Alex says, the clinic is really easy. But if you, if you mix up the two things, if you mix up the disease of obesity with the cultural desire for thinness in the way you approach your patients, it is really unpleasant clinics to do. Okay? That does not mean that people that have the disease of obesity and understand that they have the disease of obesity may not also have a cultural desire for thinness. But what is really important with our new tools is that we say to people, look, our treatments are going to make you healthier and our treatments are going to make you more functional, but our treatments may not change what you see when you look in the mirror. Okay? And once we get around those things, I think that becomes much easier. The next thing I think that is going to change dramatically is the way we define obesity. And Jaltrudy has already um, alluded to the Lancet Commission. The, there's also the EASA, the European Association of Study of Obesity. There's also the International Federation for Surgery of Obesity who are thinking about how do we define the disease of obesity. This is the World Health Organization definition, which is obesity is defined as excess or abnormal adipose tissue that causes a deterioration in health. Now, I think this is a terrible definition, okay? But I also think it is the best we can do at the moment, right? And I really think that in the next five years, we're going to have a much better definition. Right? But at the moment, this is as good as it gets, and I can't come up with anything better. But the good thing with medical progress is we are going to change the way we think about obesity in the future. One of the things that I do not think will change is the complications of obesity. I think we are pretty good at identifying more than the 220 complications of obesity. But what I do think will change is we'll be better at organizing them. We will organize them in metabolic complications, mechanical complications, and mental complications. And very often when we speak to an audience who are experts in treating type 2 diabetes and experts in treating type 1 diabetes, we naturally focus on the metabolic complications. But we will also recognize that there's many people with obesity that don't have any metabolic complications, but they may have very severe mechanical complications. They may not be able to tie their shoelaces or get in and out of the bath without trouble. And what we'll also have to realize, I think, in the future, is that one complication is not more important than another complication. But we also will realize that the, you, the patient's body mass index does not predict what complication they may have. And therefore, we need to be um, clear that we are probably dealing with different diseases. Here's a, a painting um, of a young girl. This painting hangs in the Prado in Madrid. This girl was painted in 1680. And she was six years old and she weighed 70 kilograms. So it is true, and we had a good discussion that, you know, if we looked at the 1930s in New York, I think the question was, you know, there was not that many people with obesity. But obesity is not new. Obesity has been around for a very long time. It is true that far more people have obesity now than ever had before. That is true. But it's not a new disease. Okay. But the second thing I also want to point out is that the stigma of obesity is not new. This girl was found in a rural part of Spain. She was brought to the Spanish court because the king and the queen wanted to show her when people came to visit. And they wanted to point to this girl and say, this is a really strange person. Look at what we have. Okay. So it shows you the stigma of obesity is not new. But there's never been, and I think this is going to be the future of this disease, we will, re we will realize that 
Um, there's been no disease in the history of man where we have stigmatized people with the disease and that has made the disease better. You know, 2,000 years ago, when people had leprosy, they were stigmatized and we put them somewhere else and we thought that was, to, that was the right thing to do. But that did not help the disease of leprosy. A okay? hundred years ago, if somebody fell to the floor and had a tonic-clonic convulsion you know, and had epilepsy, we thought that that person was possessed by devils. And we would pray for that person so that they would be relieved from these devils. Right? That did not help them. Okay? So we do not make diseases better by stigmatizing it. And I think the future is going to change because we're going to say that this is a bad disease. I'm really, I understand this disease is not your fault, but it is your responsibility. It is the person's responsibility to take a treatment, be it a nutritional therapy, pharmacotherapy, or surgical therapy. But I think we will realize it's not the patient's fault, but it is your responsibility and my responsibility to find a treatment for this. But I also put this picture up because I will remind myself that if this young girl comes to my clinic with a mother or grandmother, the grandmother will say to me, please, doctor, help me because my child is hungry all the time. And when I give food to my child, my child does not feel full. The child has to eat a lot of food before they feel satisfied. And many of you will have your own children or will have nieces or nephews um, or even grandchildren. And you know that your grandchildren, when they are two years old, um, sometimes they will eat like a horse, you know, and other times they won't eat at all. Okay? But, but children have perfectly controlled appetites. But you may also know that some of your children will eat and stop, and you can't make them eat any food at that point. They will just refuse. And other children are just looking for food all the time, even in the same house. Right? Those children who are looking for food, they have a disease that we understand now to be obesity, and it's not the child's fault for being hungry. But the why, reason why I'm bringing this up is for a very long time, we as doctors and healthcare professionals, we thought that our job was to make people lose weight. We thought it was about treating the signs of this disease. And now when we are having these treatments, nutritional therapies, pharmacotherapies, or surgical therapies, what patients tell us is, you know, doctors, since you started, you know, tizepatide, I just don't feel hungry. And since you've started, you know, this nutritional therapy, when I eat, I feel full. So it's also about alleviating the symptoms of this disease. And I think that's going to be the future, that we're not only going to focus on changing the signs, but we're also going to help people, you know, being alleviated from the symptoms of this disease. And the big advances now, and I'm going to even, so, so if, if you sit there, I'm going to ask you to think about for a moment if obesity is a disease, what organ in the body has the disease? Okay. So we know, we know adipose tissue is, you know, that's the sign of the disease. And we know adipose tissue is very important endocrine systems. Um, but it's not the adipocytes that, that causes obesity. The adipocytes, the excess fat, is a consequence of the, the disease. Right? So where is the disease, what organ are you treating when you treat obesity? Okay. Sorry? The brain, okay, that's a very good, and I would agree with you. So if we look at the brain, then we have to ask ourselves, you know, and I suggested to you that hunger and fullness are the symptoms of this disease. So where are the neurons in the brain that code for hunger and fullness? And again, if we look at gene-wide association studies, you can see that 90%, you guys are right when you said the brain, 90% of, or 80% of um, obesity points to the central nervous system. But the central nervous system is a pretty big place. And here I'm showing you the entire brain. And what we have had in the past is that we genuinely thought 
that obesity was a disease of the supratentorial regions, of the cortical areas of the brain. And that is why we have, in good faith, have generated treatments that we call cognitive behavior therapy. Okay? Cognitive means we focus on the cortical areas, behavior, we are changing the behaviors of people, and therapy means we are teaching people how to behave. Okay? So if you think that obesity is a disease of the cortical areas of the brain, then teaching people how to behave is a perfectly reasonable strategy. Okay? But I'm suggesting to you, and we know, because I can take a needle and I can puncture every nerve in the cortical areas of a rodent's brain, and the rat is going to become much less intelligent, and it's not going to learn so fast, but the rat is not going to eat any more food or eat any less food, because the cortical areas of the brain does not control hunger and satiety. The areas of the brain that controls hunger and satiety are the subcortical areas of the brain. I'm highlighting the hypothalamus here, but I can also show the area postremia or the nucleus tractus solitarius. So the, the insight, the future, I think, is going to be this insight that really the organ we are treating is the brain, but it is the subcortical areas of the brain, and therefore you will have sympathy with yourself, and you will have sympathy with your patient, because it's difficult to treat subcortical brain disease. It's difficult, okay? But we now have the tools to make that possible. So at least we are starting to understand, because if we look at where tizepatide binds, or we look at where semaglutide binds, semaglutide does not bind the cortical areas of the brain. Semaglutide does not make people more intelligent, it does not make people more motivated. All it does is it makes people feel less hungry and more satisfied in, this, in the early stages when we are treating it. So now at least we know where we are treating it. And the same is true for bariatric surgery, and the same is true for nutritional therapies when it forms as a treatment. Now, this is work from um, Ewan Pearson that's part of SOFIA. He is also the leader of IMI Direct, and a project that came up. And this is, this is some data from the IMI Direct project that was just published in Nature Medicine um, in 2022. And what they showed um, is that type 2 diabetes is not one disease. Type 2 diabetes are a subset of diseases. And here I'm showing you the three-dimensional maps that they've created with hemoglobin A1C and BMI, but effectively, the way if you are on the left-hand side, the way you respond or the risks that you have are completely different if you're in the left upper quadrant than if you're in the right lower quadrant. So we are now understanding and getting to this position that even when a person with type 2 diabetes walks through the door, you know, that is not one disease. And therefore, our treatments are going to become different. And we're now talking about the pharmacogenomics. Why do some people respond to GLP-1s and other people do not? And we are starting to be able to predict this. And this is what I think is going to revolutionize obesity. It's hard enough at the moment, I've, it's hard enough to convince people that obesity is a disease, right? That's hard enough. The next step is when we're going to convince, try to convince people that obesity isn't one disease, it's lots of diseases. Now, maybe if you go back in history, if we had this conference in the 1950s, and we were here, we would be talking about finding the cure for cancer. Because in the 1950s, people genuinely thought that cancer was one disease. And we were going to find the cure for cancer. Right? But today, we know that even breast cancer is nine different diseases that happen to be inside the breast. And if you are HER2 new positive, you know, you can be completely unmotivated and completely unintelligent, but if I give you Herceptin, you are going to respond, right? Equally, if you are triple negative, you know, and you are incredibly motivated, you're incredibly intelligent, you know everything there is to know about breast cancer, and I give you a really good breast cancer drug like Herceptin, you will not respond, because the biology of your disease is different. 
And that is why when we look even at amazing data, for example, like tazepatide or semaglutide or bariatric surgery, we see some people losing half of their body weight and we see some people gaining weight on the same treatment. Right? That is just because these are completely different diseases that we are treating. Coming back to the example we used before about anemia, you know, thinking about how you treat anemia is the first thing you try to do is make a diagnosis. Now, we are not smart enough to do it yet, but Sophia is going to contribute to this. And I bet you in five years, maybe ten years from now, we will be able to do this. And the minute we do this, it's going to change the way we practice. A little bit like even when I went to medical school, you know, I was taught that people that had peptic ulcer disease were anxious people, you know, and you need to calm them down, you need to give them some psychotherapy. And then we discovered that it was Helicobacter pylori, right? And now we just give people antibiotics, right? We just completely changed our minds when the data changed, and that is okay. And I think this is going to happen. The next thing I think that's going to happen in the future is here's a famous uh, photo from Professor Steve O'Reilly and Sadaf Faruqi in Cambridge of one of the first patients that were diagnosed with leptin deficiency. Now, just to remind you, leptin deficiency is incredibly rare. I still think there's less than 10 people in the world that's been diagnosed with leptin deficiency. But here you have the young child on the left, and this child was just hungry all the time. Okay? Because this child's adipocytes did not make the hormone leptin. And therefore, this child's subcortical areas of the brain thought that it was starving all the time. It did not have enough adipocytes, and therefore, the child was hungry and eating all the time. Now, when they discovered that, they treated the child, and it's the same child on the right-hand side. Okay? Now, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Who of you think that the child on the right-hand side has obesity. Raise your hands if you think the child on the right hand side has obesity. Raise your hand. Okay? It's a couple of hands. Okay? Fine. Right? Put your hand down. Now I'm going to give you another option. The child on the left hand side has a blood pressure of 200 over 120. Okay? I treat that child with effective pharmacotherapy, and the child on the right hand side now has three agents that they're taking, um, but the child's blood pressure now is 120 over 80. Okay? Who thinks that the child on the right hand side with a blood pressure of 120 over 80 with three medications, who thinks that child has hypertension? Raise your hand. Right, okay? That is what I think is going to change in the future, right? So what the child on the left has is obesity. What the child on the right has is well-treated obesity, right? So our effective treatments, be it surgery, pharmacotherapies, or nutritional therapies, will not be able to cure obesity, the only thing we can do, the best I think we can hope for, is that we will have well-treated obesity. So if you ever see somebody saying these new treatments are going to reduce obesity, no, it won't. Okay? It will reduce people's body mass indexes. It will reduce the complications of obesity. But people with these treatments will have to take it for the rest of their lives. You take a nutritional therapy, you have to do it for the rest of your life, or pharmacotherapy, or surgical therapy. Because the minute you stop the, stop the treatment, the, the disease will relapse. If I stop the leptin on the child on the right, the child is going to revert to a phenotype as shown on the left. Because leptin therapy doesn't cure the obesity, it treats the obesity. And of course, we've heard today already about new treatments such as loraclotide and semaclotide. But I want to show you the next, and, and, um, the next thing that I think is going to change in the future. And that, you know, Alex has alluded to it. At the moment, if you ask anybody, they will say, if you want to run an obesity service, you have to have a very good multidisciplinary team. Okay? Because that is the best thinking at, of the time. But what do I think is going to happen in future? Okay? And I say this to you because I trained as a lipidologist in one of the best hospitals for lipid treatment in the world, the Hammersmith. You know, and we had 
we had big multidisciplinary teams. We had um, LDL apheresis. We did terminal ileum bypasses, you know, as was shown in the randomized control trial in the POSH study for people with familial hypercholesterolemia. And then we got statins. And we completely changed the way we practiced, right? So if we now think about obesity, let's look at the step one study that was shown. And this is 16% weight loss with semaglutide 2.4 milligrams. With a 500 calorie diet, 150 minutes of exercise. So any good general practitioner can give this to the patient. Here is the step three study. Intensive behavior therapy. Psychological visits, dietetic visits every two weeks, seeing um, a, a, an exercise physiologist with semaglutide 2.4 milligrams, 16% weight loss. Okay? Here is the step teen study. Now we're treating 12 year olds to 18 year olds. Right? And most of you that have children or have grandchildren will know that a 12 to 18 year old almost never listens to what you say and hardly ever does what you say. And we know that because if you look at the placebo arm, they're the only ones that didn't lose weight. Let's just go back. Do you see how effective step three was? The placebo arm, intensive lifestyle therapy, gave almost 7 or 8% weight loss. Here is the um, step one placebo arm. Adults, they get about 2 to 3% weight loss. Now look at the placebo arm for step teens, 0% weight loss, okay? Because they are adolescents. That's what they're supposed to do. They're hardwired for that, okay? But now look at the weight loss in the semaglutide arm, 16% weight loss, okay? So if you treat adults and you tell them to eat less and move more, they lose 16% weight. If you treat Adults, and you give them incredibly intensive treatment, 16% weight loss. If you treat children that don't listen to anybody, 16% weight loss. Right? So I work in one of the best centers, obesity centers in the world. We have some of the best treatment options at the moment. But I'm pretty confident that if the man on the dark side of the moon prescribes semaglutide 2.4 milligrams, they're going to have exactly the same amount of weight loss than I do. Okay? Because there's nothing that I do that actually makes these people lose weight. It is the drug. Right? And therefore, if we can teach people, you know, as Alex has said, you know, in the periphery to, to treat people with obesity with these effective treatments, if we can show them how to do it safely and effectively, we are going to do a massive service to our communities. And remember, again, I'll, I'll remind you that certainly in Europe, we have dramatically reduced the number of heart attacks that people get and the number of deaths from cardiovascular disease. And it's not because we are prescribing statins in hospitals that that has happened. The reason why we've reduced mortality from cardiovascular events in Europe is because general practitioners are prescribing statins and ACE inhibitors really effectively. And some of you in the audience may remember when, when we had the Captopril test. Captopril, you had to bring people into hospital to give them an ACE inhibitor to make sure that the kidneys don't shut down. Right? Today, you know, general practitioners are prescribing ACE inhibitors and it's really effectively treating it. So yes, it's a process. Yes, we have to start obesity treatments in specialist centers, but the quicker we can move it into the periphery, the quicker we're going to have a benefit. You've already seen the slide where I'm suggesting to you, in the future, we will no longer think overeating causes obesity, but we will understand that the disease of obesity causes people to overeat. That sounds a little bit crazy if I say that to you right now, and I appreciate that sounds a bit crazy, okay? But let me try to say something to you a little bit closer to home. Do you think eating sugar causes diabetes? Right? But you understand that if you have diabetes, type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes, you will have increased plasma sugar. Right? And that is the same concept. That's the same concept as understanding that the disease of obesity causes you to overeat than it is to understand that the disease of diabetes causes increased plasma sugar. So we've seen the tazepatide data. 
I am just want to remind you, 22% weight loss. We had a fantastic lecture, um, you know, uh, showing the tazepatide data and people with diabetes. Here I'm showing you the people without type 2 diabetes. Um, and this is revolutionary, where we have a third of people losing 25% of their body weight. Okay? Now, that is what you remember, and that's what you should remember. But now, you're going to start treating people with tazepatide. And it turns out you're going to have exactly the same responses than anybody else in the world with these treatments. And here I'm showing you the individual responses to tazepatide, right? And what I'm showing you on the top hand is, first of all, the placebo arm. And you can see that 70% of people in the, tazepatide arm, in the tazepatide studies with placebo lost weight. But you will also see that a third of people gained weight while they were having lifestyle treatment, you know, in this study. Now look at the tazepatide arm. Here you see that 97% of people lost weight. And if you go all the way to the right-hand side, the last blue line, there was a person in the tazepatide study that lost 50% of their body weight. They lost half of their body weight. That means if they had a BMI of 40, we took them down to a BMI of 20. Okay? So for the first time ever in these studies, we are thinking we have to have rescue therapies for if we make people go too low. Okay? But it shouldn't be a challenge because this is just another hormone. So again, I think at the moment people are saying you must use the regulated doses. Everybody must have 10 milligrams or 15 milligrams of tazepatide. Okay? But if I say to you, I give you insulin, okay? but you are only allowed to use the maximum dose of insulin that you can get out of that pen every time. You will say to me, you're completely crazy because everybody is going to have hypos all the time, right? So it's just a hormone. Insulin is just a hormone. You know, GLP-1, GIP are just hormones. We do not have to use the highest dose. You use the dose that is effective to your patient. So I think that's going to be a big change. But another change that I also want you to think about in the future, right now you, we are all thinking 22% weight loss on average. That is amazing. But that's the, me, that's the, that's the median weight loss. Right? It's also the mean weight loss for that matter because it's a Gaussian distribution. But remember the edges of that distribution. You will see here on the bottom there, there were about 3% you know, of people, 2.5% of people on tazepatide taking the drug at 15 milligrams who gained weight. Okay? So do not be shocked if you have people you know, that you treat with tazepatide or semaglutide 2.4 milligrams that don't lose weight. Because there are certain types of diseases that that will happen. But please promise me when you do that, and I'm pleading to you right now, please do not blame the patient. Because if you want to experience the most extreme forms of stigmatization, you should go to a bariatric surgery clinic where somebody had a very good sleeve gastrectomy or gastric bypass and did not lose weight. Those patients are told, you must be an incredibly bad person. I have done a very good operation, you know, and look at how bad a person you are. You don't even respond to the best treatment. And that is what's going to happen when we start treating people with these drugs. If you say to somebody, and they come back and they say, no, the drug's not working, the first thing you're going to ask them, and it's reasonable, it's a reasonable question, are you taking it right? You know? And even people who take the drug in exactly the right way, there will be some of them that don't respond. I completely accept and agree there will be some people that will just not be compliant. Compliance is difference to response. Okay? We have to work those two things out because that will be very important. So what we will understand, and I'm showing you this, this graph because this is another thing that I think is going to be very important for the future. These drugs are now being sold to you and explained to you as these drugs change appetite. These drugs change hunger and change satiety. 
And that is very true, and it's incredibly valuable because when you start the treatment while patients are losing weight, this is exactly what they report. And here's another um, Greek character um, that actually he was so hungry that he had to sell his daughter to get money to buy food. Okay? Um, and it just shows you, if you're hungry all the time, what you are driven to, it is an incredibly bad thing. So when you start treating people with these medications, they will come back to you and say, Doctor, this is the best thing you've ever done. I'm just not thinking about food all the time. I'm not driven to food. And it is wonderful. Okay? But then, one year after you've treated the patient, the patient is going to come back to you and going to say to you, Doctor, the treatment is not working anymore because now I feel hungry, now I'm eating more food, and I know this drug isn't working. And you will say to yourself, well, this is a really expensive drug. This patient has lost 22% of their body weight. So obviously it worked, but the patient tells me, you know, they're feeling hungry. And the company told me this is a drug that reduced hunger. Okay? So clearly the drug is not working anymore. Okay. Now, I will urge you at that point, do not stop the drug because if you continue the drug, what will happen is the patient will become more hungry, the patient will eat more food, but the patient will not gain weight because what has happened is the patient has come into a new state of homeostasis. The patient was in homeostasis before treatment. The patient will come to new homeostasis. And while they are coming down, they feel less hungry, they feel more full, they eat less food. But once they reach the new state of homeostasis, they will just become normal again. However, if you stop the drug, the patient will become hyperphagic. The patient will become obsessed with food and will regain weight rapidly. And we are seeing that after we stop all the drugs and the drug trials now. The patients come back and they are beside themselves from hunger. Right? And it's actually, it almost borders, a lot of people are now saying, is it ethical for us to stop the treatments after? Because the patients become anxious, they, they develop severe mental health Im impairment because they are, they are so ravenous. They feel like that gentleman, you know, that Greek character who sold his daughter because he's that, they are that hungry when you stop the drug. The final thing I think that I will say what the future will hold is that when you lose a third of your body weight or 25% of your body weight, it is true that you will lose predominantly fat mass. And that has massive benefits metabolically, it has massive benefits um, also mechanically. But if you lose that much weight, you are also going to lose muscle mass. And I don't think we are paying enough attention at the moment to the muscle mass that people will lose and how we will prevent that from happening. Now let me be clear. I don't think it is a game changer. I don't think it is the reason why we should not treat people. But it's something that we need to work out very quickly in the future because we're going to take people, we're going to make them lose weight, and patients are going to come to us and they're going to say, I just don't feel as strong as I used to be. Okay? And therefore, we need to be able to address that and think about that. Now, the, fat, the, the muscle mass that people are losing is not as much as we thought it would be because people come to homeostasis, but it is still substantial enough for patients to, to come be concerned about it. So those are the, uh, the websites again for Sophia because I think Sophia is going to be part of changing this. So I'm going to summarize and suggest to you. Up to this point, most of us genuinely thought that obesity was an energy balance problem. It means that we thought the problem with obesity was that there was too much energy in and not enough energy out. Okay, so let me suggest to you, this is my house in Northern Europe, okay? And what you will see at the bottom on the left-hand side is my boiler that generates energy into the system. And the windows in my house is pretty good because it's very well insulated, so it reduces the energy out. And my house 
typically is running at about 21 degrees Celsius. So that's the temperature inside my house. Right? Now, when my children run around and they leave the door open or they leave a window open, my house loses a lot of energy. There's a lot of energy that suddenly goes outside of my house. But the temperature inside my house does not change. And the reason why it does not change is because the boiler starts working and it pumps energy into the system. So even when the windows are open, the house temperature remains the same because the boiler is so good, it's just keeping the energy the same. It's keeping the temperature the same. So the, the temperature in my house is not controlled by the boiler and it's not controlled by the windows. The temperature in my house is not controlled by energy in, energy out. The temperature in my house is controlled by the thermostat that I change inside my house. And sometimes my wife wants to make their house 25 Celsius and she turns up the thermostat, right? And then the house is 25 Celsius. And then when I come in, I turn the temperature down to 20 Celsius. Now what happens is the minute I turn it down, the boiler stops working. The boiler is not pushing energy into the system anymore. But it only does that until the house comes to 20 Celsius. When it comes to the new state of homeostasis, then the boiler kicks in again and starts working. Okay? So that is what's going to happen to patients. Their obesity is not controlled by energy in or energy out. Their obesity is controlled, we think, by the thermostat, effectively, that sits in the subcortical areas of the brain that controls the amount of adipocytes the body wants to carry. And if you treat the person with obesity with tazepatide or semaglutide or an operation, and they have a BMI of 40, and they come down to a BMI of 28, what will happen is on the way down, the boiler won't work, so they won't have energy in. They will eat less. The minute they come to their new set point at the BMI of 28, the boiler is going to start working again. Okay? They're going to eat. They're going to actually stay in the new level of homeostasis. Okay? So I think this is going to be something for the future where we understand obesity not as an energy in, energy out problem, but we stand obesity, uh, obesity as a fundamental pathophysiological process that is deranged. And what we will be able to do is treat the pathophysiology of obesity. And the way we will treat it is with nutritional therapies, with pharmacotherapies, and with surgical therapies. And the way we know it will work is when people come back to us and they say they have a reduction in appetitive behavior. And as I said, while they are coming down to the new set point, they will have less hunger and more satiety. But that will stabilize when they come to it. So I'm going to conclude and suggest that we will only be successful in the future. And I think this is what the future will do because we will be, we are always more successful in the future. So it just, it just depends on how quickly we get there. But what we will get to is a point where we will treat obesity as we treat any other disease. Right? And you know, I am going to show a hierarchy because we need to have a structure of thinking. Okay, so you know, I think we do need more self-directed lifestyle changes. But people that don't respond to that, they need to be referred to, for example, professionally directed lifestyle changes. If they don't respond to that, they need to be considered for anti-obesity therapies. If they don't respond to that, and we know if they don't respond within three months, they need to be considered for surgery. And if they don't respond for surgery, they need to be considered for com com uh, combination therapies where I completely agree with both Alex and Eba that made the point, is today I don't have a blood test or a questionnaire that can tell me this patient must have um, a medication, or this patient must have a nutritional therapy, or this person is not going to respond to bariatric surgery. And there's some pretty good data in Nature Medicine earlier this year that shows whether or not I decide as a doctor or whether the patient decides where they enter that system makes no difference. Okay? So if a patient comes to me with a body mass index of 41 and the patient says to me, I would really like a nutritional therapy, 
I am not going to say to that patient, no, you must have an operation. I'm going to say to that patient, listen, we have nutritional therapies, pharmacotherapies, and surgical therapies. If you want to start with the nutritional therapy, that's a good place to start. It's as good as anywhere. But if you don't respond, we need to change. If that same patient comes, you know, two days later and say, you know, doctor, I read a little bit more. Actually, now I would like to have an operation, right? The patient is eligible for an operation, and there's nothing that would suggest that they must force the patient to have a nutritional therapy or a pharmacotherapy first. So that is why we are trained as clinicians. You know, we need to have a framework. We need to understand that we actually have an ability to go through a normal treatment regimen, but we also need to understand that we need to personalize our, medicine, our, our treatments. And unfortunately today, we don't have a biomarker that tells me, listen, you will really respond to treatment X, or really you should never have treatment Y because you will have complications. We're not there yet. So I would like us to be humble and say, look, you know, we don't have that information. Let's work with our patients and actually don't block people from having treatments, you know, but make sure that if they don't respond to a treatment that you are able to escalate them. So in conclusion, I will say the future of obesity um, care will include that we are thinking of this as a chronic treatment aimed at health gain not weight loss. Okay? When I treat somebody with a statin, I don't treat them to reduce their cholesterol. I treat them to reduce their macrovascular complications. If I treat somebody with an ACE inhibitor, I don't treat them for their blood pressure. I treat them because I want to reduce the complications of hypertension. Okay? The treatments for obesity is not there for weight loss. They are there for health gain. Secondly, I think we will be recognizing the different subtypes of the disease. We are not there at the moment. I have no ability to make that diagnosis, but we will have that ability in the future. We will have predictors of risks and predictors of response. And that is, right now, we have incredible treatments. You know, we don't, you know, but, you know, in the future, we will want more weight loss with fewer side effects. And we don't want people that don't respond. And that is going to be possible. We'll need, uh, you know, it will include needing more and different treatments for the subtypes. So I think we will need more nutritional therapies. We will need more pharmacotherapies. And I think we'll need more surgical therapies. You know, a lot of people are saying now pharmaceutical companies should stop inventing new treatments for uh, obesity because we now have tazepatide and we don't need anything more. That would be a little bit like saying to somebody, you know, um, we had simvastatin in 2002 and we should stop inventing. You know, we would never have had PCSK9 inhibitors. You know, we would never have had resuvastatin. You know, so, so no, I think we need more innovation and we need more different medications and nutritional therapies and surgery. And ultimately, I think the future of obesity care will include not blaming our patients for their disease or if they don't respond. So thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you for all the kindness.